there was a phenomenon that began after the coming of the Prophet Once something is successful, people without the desire and without the brains follow and jump on the success. Right? This is human nature. Once the person who is the most authentic or the most or the genius, it is business. Very simple. The one who does it first, everybody then wants to tack on. Correct? So the Prophet وسلم, when he proclaimed he is Prophet, no one in Arabia had proclaimed this ever since the time of Ibrahim and Ismail. It's not something they are familiar with. Now that the Prophet has begun his da'wah, it has reached such success, what do you think losers are going to do? Tack on to the success of the Prophet wasallam. That's exactly what happened. A number of false pseudo-prophets, kathabun basically, came and tacked themselves on. Sajjah bint al-Harith. And Sajjah bint al-Harith, she was from the tribe of the Banu Tamim and she was from Najd proper. On this side, Hijaz, the Imam of the Najd. So Sajjah was from Najd. And Sajjah, we don't know that much about her, but she was also a Christian. And by the way, so why are these all Christians? Because Christians, they believe in prophets anyway. So it's easier for them to make this false claim, number one. Number two, Christians were more educated than pagans. So Christians had more exposure to civilization. Sajjah as well seems to have been very learned before the coming of Islam. And she was in fact a very, very skilled poetess. She was gifted with this talent of being very uh, eloquent. And so whatever she would say, she would always say uh, in the nathr. And we said nathr is a type of rap basically. It's not the poetry, but it is a type of rap or a very profound rap. Whatever she would say, she'd always have it in that type of metered and structured uh, speech. And she also began to claim that she is receiving wahi from the heavens, that she's receiving wahi from the heavens. And she must have been respected amongst her people before this anyway. So her people followed her and she reached out to a number of other chieftains of the Banu Tamim tribe. The Banu Tamim, by the way, all the Arabs here know, the Banu Tamim is like the largest Arab tribe ever. Right, when you say the Banu Tamim, it is still to this day, it has, I don't know how many hundreds of mini branches. Even in those days, the Banu Tamim had lots of branches. And so she's the head of one of the branches. She reaches out to the other branches and a number of them agree to join her. Amongst them is the most famous uh, Malik ibn Nuwayra. Uh, but Malik ibn Nuwayra uh, actually had visited the Prophet Wasallam, And the Prophet Wasallam, and he accepted Islam. And the Prophet appointed him to be the, the, he was the chieftain, so the Prophet allowed him to be the chieftain. And he was supposed to be the tax, the zakat collector, send it back to Medina. When the Prophet passed away, Malik ibn Nawayla used this to basically say, I don't have to pay zakat. Then he joined Sajjah. And this clearly shows that joining Sajjah was in fact a political move so that he has protection against the caliphate from attacking him for the zakat issue. It's not as if he actually believed. And so more and more of them joined together with Sajjah and Sajjah decided to launch a full off offensive against Medina. She wanted to attack Medina. But on the way to Medina is Yamama. And in Yamama there is Musaylama. And between the two of them, the Banu Hanifa and the Banu Tamim, there were tensions from the days of Jahiliyyah. So Sajjah said, on the way to Medina, we will first deal with Musaylama. Clear? Okay. So Musaylama heard the news. Sajjah had managed to gather 40,000 people. I mean, that is a huge number. Huge number. And the main reason that she gathered this many people was because here's the point here that there's revolutions going on. The revolution of Islam has come. The air is exciting with people now claiming power. Muslims are a political entity. So now other groups want to take over. So the Tamim tribe feels we can now take over what the Prophet have done. Most of the people did not convert to Sajjah or to Musaylama. 
Remember I said this last uh, many, many months ago when we talked about Usaylama that when one of the Sahabi asked one of the Banu Hanifa, do you really believe in this guy? Do you really believe in him? What did their guy say from the, uh, from the tribe of the Banu Hanifa? The liar of Banu Hanifa is more beloved to me than the truthful one of the Quraysh. This is the attitude, right? The liar of Banu Hanifa is more beloved to me. He's my blood. I'll have him as my ruler rather than the truthful person of the Quraysh. So what we need to understand, these people don't believe Sajjah is a prophetess. Or maybe some of them did, but I'm saying bulk of them is just political. You want to gain political power. So Musaylama hears Sajjah has 40,000 troops and she's marching against you. Musaylama panicked. He did not have 40,000 troops. And if 40,000 troops came to him, most likely he would have been killed. So he, and you can tell this man is a politician. He is a, uh, uh, a skilled politician. He decided to gamble on a tactic. And that tactic is very bizarre, very interesting. And it is mentioned in a lot of detail in Al-Tabari and other books. Uh, he ordered that, uh, he sent a message to Sajjah that we should meet the two of us because you claim to be a prophetess, I claim to be a prophet, the both of us can't be right. So let us debate it out and let us see who amongst us is the correct one. Okay, so she agreed, she fell for the trap. Then he said that we will build for her a special tent outside of the encampment of the tribe of the Banu Hanifa before she gets to the city in a place away from the city. And he ordered a expensive and lavish tent be built made out of brocades and silk and cloth. Uh, he then made the offer that why don't the two, two of us join our forces as we had joined ourselves. Let us join our forces and we will get rid of all of the other Muslims. So this was, I mean, a sly, conniving politician, dare I say? I mean, you know, it's like, what can I say, right? I mean, this was his tactic, that he wanted to join forces together. So he seduced her with all that he could and it worked. And now he says, let's join our forces together and attack the, uh, attack the Muslims. Uh, she stayed there for a few days and then uh, she went back. So she changed, she delayed the plan of attacking Medina. So she goes back to her land and he stays in his land. And the plan was to join forces and attack Medina. In the meantime, Khalid ibn al-Walid is sent by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So he sent Khalid ibn al-Walid to fight Musaylama in al-Yamama and the uh, forces of Khalid, of course, uh, completely annihilated uh, the forces of Musaylama. Sajjah at this point was still in Najd. By the way, so Musaylama's followers, some of them still remain, by the way, and they fled away here and there. They remained on that religion for another few decades, believe it or not. Books of history mention there were still some small followers until finally in Qaradu, they just dissipated and disappeared. Sajjah, she was still in Najd. So when she heard of Khalid's arrival, she simply fled. And she, and she fled to Iraq. And that at the time, Iraq was not conquered by Islam. Eventually, Iraq was conquered. And she was in Basra and Kufa. And she moved between Basra and Kufa. And by that time, by the time Islam came, sometime between this incident and Islam coming, Sajjah had repented, re-accepted Islam, and lived the rest of her life as a Zahida, Abida, Da'iba, just like ascetic saint. This is one of those interesting quirks. So when Islam came to the lands of Iraq, Sajjah had already embraced it and she was already openly repentant and therefore she was left unharmed because she had embraced Islam of her own free will. And she died a Muslima and uh, the, um, the governor of Iraq, subhanAllah, the name is missing me now, but the, the Sahabi, famous Sahabi, he prayed Janazah for her, prayed Janazah over her, said Jah. So this is one of those interesting twists that one earlier part of her life she claimed to be a prophetess, and then she repented. And if you repent outside of the reach of the state, even for such crimes, 
it shows something. And she embraced Islam again and she died uh, a Muslim.